Um, my background's perhaps a bit different to some other people in the sense that I didn't go to university. I started um, equity, or equity roles, albeit junior roles, at the age of 18. Um, and my father ran a hardware store, and I just knew that I thought the stock market was interesting. That's as far as I got at the age of 18. And then I worked my way through different sort of junior roles. Uh, this started in 1987, and I worked on the buy side a little bit. I worked on the sell side and the stockbroking side a little bit. Um, uh, I worked for Merrill Lynch for about 10 years as an analyst in the transport sector. Um, and then I started my own company about 11 years ago. Um, and maybe about 15, 16 years ago, I got really into sort of great investing and, uh, and that's what led to me starting my own company. Well, that's very interesting because I'm probably give you a list of traits, a lot of which I might not possess. So I think, you know, real patience, real, the ability to not make a decision for long, long periods of time. The ability to be, I think, be very sort of happy in your own company and working by yourself for long periods of time. Uh, and I think, I forget who it was, one of the great researchers or, or um, investors wrote about the fact that the, the, the attributes that make you an interesting and popular human being are perhaps the attributes that you actually don't want to have in investing. You want to be that sort of bookworm type character. Uh, I mean, I think there's a balance and I, I like people. I like interacting with people. But I know that to be a good investor, I do a good job and I get a lot done if I spend time by myself. So I, I like a balance. I spend lots of weeks by myself reading and thinking. And then it's really fun to come to Madrid and meet some people and learn about things and then go back to my office and work on them again. So I, I think you probably need to be a calm, quiet, reflective person. And I may be a little bit too active, but life's fun that way. Yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting question because... I think in theory, you just answer that question and say, oh, I'm a Bear Graham investor or I'm a Buffett investor. Um, uh, the presentation I've done today is where I've talked about um, the difference between what you think and what you do. So I've written a lot about return on capital employed and compounding and great franchise businesses. But when I set up my fund six or seven years ago, I found that I was buying lots of cheap, special situation, deep value shares. So, and actually I now regret not having bought more compounding franchises. So I, I think I am at my heart a munger franchise, high return on capital employed investor, but I'm very mean on the prices I want to pay. So I want it both ways. I want the compounding, but I don't want to pay the in price, if you like. So, so it tends to be that the way that I think about things is I want to own great companies run by great managers, but I want to buy them at great prices. I'm pretty old fashioned actually in the sense that I will, I will look at earnings, I will look at cash flow. Um, I mean, generally, uh, in terms of its cheapness, it's often a function of what do I think it's going to compound at. So if a business I think isn't going to grow very much, well then it's multiple of earnings or cash flow, I'm, not, I'm much meaner on the price, I'll pay for it. Whereas a business that I think can grow a lot and actually has very little capital required to grow, so it can really generate some phenomenal cash returns and growth, well, I'll pay a lot more for. In terms of metric, it's largely earnings, actually. I used to spend a lot of time on free cash flow, but often the free cash flow is a check. It's a check to say, are the earnings a real reflection of the business? And even businesses that have got fantastic free cash flow that's so much better than earnings, it's often a function of working capital and therefore you have to make sure that that's a permanent feature. So it's free cash and it's, and it's earnings together probably. Um, I think again, there's a difference between theory and practice. I think people like Buffett, Monish Pabrai, um, people that have studied the Kelly formula tell you you need to own six stocks or seven stocks to get diversification. I think that's definitely right, but it's really hard to sleep at night. And I think you need to work out who you are and how many stocks you want to have and how successful you are at picking winners and occasionally picking losers too. And for me, I'm in the sort of 25 stock, 20 stock sort of portfolio, which many people think I think is sort of quite focused, but from a deep and from a traditional value perspective, it's not as concentrated as it could be. So for me, that's just a it's not about a maximization of value in a sort of spreadsheet way that the Kelly formula does. It's just a way of saying, how can I have the best spread of businesses at the best prices, but to give me a little bit of margin of safety? Because 
I will be wrong sometimes. In terms of uh, actual numbers and, look, and um, turnover, I don't know, actually. I mean, the reality, I, I, I just haven't got the data. I, um, I could look it up, but the answer is not very much. Um, the businesses we are trying to find and invest in are the businesses that generally we would love to own for long periods of time. Um, I mean, we sort of buy three buckets of co companies. We buy rare birds, as we call them, real specialist growth, high return on capital employed businesses. And we buy undervalued compounders and we buy what we call um, uh, capital cycle plays. The first two are businesses that you would expect to own for quite long periods of time, you know, three, four, five years maybe. The, 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 la the latter one, we own the shipping company, we own a few banks, you know, that's a function of how quickly they recover and if they recover. And if they do, you might sell them more quickly. So it sort of varies on different parts of the portfolio. Um, but I think as I'm becoming even more franchise centric than perhaps I was seven or eight years ago, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more inclined to have even less turnover. Um, I think is a, cash is a vastly underrated asset class, um, not because it makes you any money, but because it gives you freedom and gives you um, options to buy wonderful businesses at times that Mr. Market spews them out because something has gone terribly wrong. That said, I think there's a few too many value investors that pride themselves on how big their cash portfolio is. And in truth, that's not my job. My job is to, if I can find 25 great companies that I think are fantastically undervalued somewhere in the world, I should own them. And if I don't have any cash as a consequence of that, great. I mean, generally I'm on, I sit on two, three, four, seven percent cash, something of that nature. Um, but I'm very happy for it to go to zero and I'm very happy for it to go to 20% if I just can't find anything. Everywhere is the honest answer. Um, uh, occasionally I'll get an idea from another investor at a conference. But not often, but occasionally. Um, uh, occasionally I'll get an idea from screening. Like we use things like Joel Greenblatt screens. Um, sometimes it just comes from just, I think the key thing is knowing what you're looking for. And if you know what you're looking for, occasionally stocks come up. Um, and I'm often trying to buy companies that I have had or do have in some relationship with. Whether that be Apple, whether it be WWE is a resting business that we own or Disney. You know, there's lots and lots and lots of businesses that we have contact with in our lives. And those are businesses you actually know better than you think you do. Then you can look at the financings when they're offered at a cheap price. So, so there's a lot of things that just sort of, we read a lot, we think a lot, and some things just come. Uh, we, did, we, we, we don't look at them in a sort of brutal, systematic way, because I think it can, you can spend a lot of your time looking backwards. But we do look at them, and I particularly look at them from a style perspective and say, look, what types of companies was I buying? And really... Uh, and I, what I've reflected on recently is that actually I'm not a very good deep value investor. I, I, for, I don't know why, but I'm a much better compounder finding franchise and compounding businesses when everyone else thinks there's something wrong with them. And I think it's partly about just working out what you're good at. And I think looking at past mistakes helps you do that. and just helps you make a slightly better hit rate of investments in the future, but also a slightly better way to work out what you do with your time. Um, so yeah, we, we look at them and we're mean to ourselves, but not too mean. Um, yeah, we're very much of the Buffett sort of camp in the circle of competence. Um, we're very much in the, if we can understand it and think about the business and understand what it does, then we'll plausibly invest in it. Um, we don't do pharmaceuticals, it's too complicated. We don't do biotech or anything of that nature. We don't really do technology either, unless it's a business that we think we could have some understanding of. Um, one sector I will mention is banks. So a lot of investors that talk in franchise language, like we do, don't own, own banks. We do. And we think some banks can be franchises. And we are particularly interested in what we call the capital cycle plays. When a sector cycle has run through an incredibly down period, people get very, very depressed on those companies. And they forget that some of them are market leading compounding businesses Wells Fargo is a good company, it's not just a good bank. JP Morgan is a good company, not just a good bank. So, so, so we have areas that we don't go in, but we also have areas that we do go in that we think other people should, and in all truth, I'm quite pleased that they don't.